this time on Colores. Visionary Albuquerque designer Kenji Kondo focuses on sustainability and aesthetics, but also on making design tools accessible to other artists. Technology has, has kind of put manufacturing basically on its ear. What this has done is made it almost like going to Kinko's. With weathered wood from across the Rocky Mountain region, craftsmen Josh Mabe and Randy Valentine create rustic furniture with a story to share. And that's the part of that frontier life, that, that old wild west life that yeah. just so brings yeah. me alive. Yeah. Like you, you just gotta make things work. Since 1970, artisan Charlie Hoffman has been handcrafting acoustic guitars. He shares his process and the sound he likes to hear. I'm not a musician, but I can contribute by making guitars for other people to make music. Sam and Sarah Evans fix pianos piece by piece. They understand the importance people can attach to an instrument generation after generation. When it's really a piece of the family, a piece of the family's history, we're renewing it for the next generation. It's all ahead on Colores. Visionary Kenji Kondo shares his thoughts on design and sustainability. From a very young age, I was influenced by design, and I always knew that everything that you touched was designed. Um, I remember growing up and even going to a restaurant with my family, and this, every meal was started this way. And my dad would make this little object out of the wrapper of a chopsticks, a pair of chopsticks and it would become the rest for the chopsticks. Everywhere you turn, somebody designed something that you're touching. The cost of machinery has come down so drastically that anybody can buy the equipment and start working. The technology has, has kind of put manufacturing basically on its ear. What this has done is made it almost like going to Kinko's. When somebody comes in and they, if they know what their, what their end product is, then obviously it's very easy. If they don't know what their end product is, all of us can help them find their end product. And not that it's any new concept, Industrial design houses have done it forever, uh, but it's at a much more accessible level. So you can walk in the door, hand somebody a jump drive, and a day later or 30 minutes later, you can walk out with an object. Our first step is taking our idea and bringing it into the computer. And in this case, we'll uh, we bring it into a 3D program. After we, we're comfortable with the drawing, we'll either take it into a process called rapid prototyping, or in this case, we build a model uh, using a laser cutter to cut all the pieces. Once the fit of the model is correct, we can then take it and bring it up to full scale, and we bring it onto a CNC router, which cuts the parts out of plywood uh, that can then be assembled, painted, and delivered. You can get all the mistakes out of the drawing pretty much in one, you know, one shot. all the notches will, will line up and that way when it goes into the real material we now know that the fit is correct.
My, my range of design goes from a tissue box cover all the way to furniture. We've pretty much cut everything that you can cut in a laser or on a CNC router or a plasma cutter. One of the main reasons I started uh, looking at this avenue for manufacturing was that uh, for a long time I was on the road a tremendous amount and I had all this equipment and it was lying dormant for 50% of the year. For me it felt like it was a, a way to have it running and give access to people. Once somebody purchases an object, it can be made quickly with just a push of a button. And at the same time, it can be made both locally and I can send that same file to Brooklyn and have it manufactured there as well. So your carbon footprint is decreased because there's no trucks involved. So that means that the manufacturing points are also saving that dollar for the consumer. I came from a sculpture and architecture background and in sculpture you make objects that initially make you happy first with the hopes that they make somebody else happy or they understand what you're, what you're thinking about. To me, it's, it's really design is trying to make objects that people will keep. When I was growing up, I grew up with great design and a lot of those objects I still have. I think you have to build things to last uh, because the resources aren't there to not do that. I mean, I, I want my objects to last. I want them to be around for a very long time. I guess what's important in my work is that it's solid, in that people recognize it and appreciate it. I think good aesthetics uh, almost create peace in, in people. Craftsmen Josh Mabe and Randy Valentine create furniture inspired by the pioneer spirit of reusing materials. There's a bunch of stuff right here. Wouldn't that be cool? You can almost wrap the corner of a table. That's perfect. Taking some of these pieces of wood that don't have what most people would consider any character at all. Just take a cross section of this and then marrying them with some pieces that have a tremendous amount of natural character and bring it into a story that is beautiful. That's our lives. See so kind of the blues in there? Yeah. Like 21 5 is actually a reference to a verse in the Bible. It's one of our favorite Bible verses. It's Revelation chapter 21 verse 5 and it's where Jesus says, Behold I make all things new. And that parallels so closely we thought with what we do is we're taking something that's old and broken and beaten up and we make it new. Here's a couple pieces of furniture right here. With this line, like from the Ray Ranch, one of the storylines that we can bring is not everything here was really gonna be used for something later that's beautiful. If we can capture that emotional side of it, that's what I wanna do. Look at this. The story is really important for us. This is the part that's so cool. It's important for us because when we deliver a piece of furniture, you want people to know the history behind it. I might have been the escape route, <laughs> so I was getting in trouble. Every part of our story, every part of our history makes up who we are. We can envision the horses over here in their stalls. That's really what we look for in the wood that we choose. And that's the part of that frontier life, that, that old wild west life that just so brings me alive. Yeah. Like you, you just gotta make things work. From a piece that is splintered and unusable to a piece that has natural character just built right into it. The door right there. Yeah is phenomenal. The colors that happen naturally that you can't duplicate no matter what you do. We'll try to keep the rusted natural colors in there. And what we could do is combine it with some different blues and grays. The original bolts in here, we could actually preserve these in a few of the pieces. That complements the, the collective, the whole piece of furniture. And uh, that's just what we are. That's what we're about at 21.5. It's our story 
that makes us who we are and beautiful. I just really want to thank you for letting us come. Like this is such a blessing to be able to come here. I know it's going to good hands. Yeah, yeah. That makes it, you know, a lot better for me. And we just love hearing the story too. Like that's that's 90% of it for us because we can source wood from different places, but you just being willing to sit down with us and talk to us, we could listen to that all day long. Feel this thing. <laughs> this is an old hinge. It's gotta be an old hinge. So we stick that, feel this thing. We stick that on a door somewhere. Holy cow. Everything that we, that we harvest is reclaimed, so we don't cut down any trees. Not only we're not cutting down trees, but now we're gonna be planting trees for every piece of furniture that we sell. The sustainability movement is definitely part of our culture now, but as a business, it's just a natural outpouring of who we are into our work. We would be doing this, I really believe, without this movement of sustainability throughout our culture, just because it is what our furniture is, and it's also who we are. It's important for us to care for the environment. It's important for us to care for the planet, for our kids. You know, that we want them to enjoy this as well. So we feel like uh, that's something that we can do to, to give back. Josh has taken this furniture to a whole new level in his approach and his design. It's not just another piece of furniture. It's not just another piece of reclaimed furniture. He's added elements to it that are completely unique that I haven't seen anywhere else. A lot of times you look out at creation in, in the mountains and that is a form of art that you can't hardly behold. Your eyes can't hardly take in. And that's what we're trying to do with our 21.5 furniture. Make it art so when people look at it, they're stunned. That can lead to transformation. That can open people's eyes up to a whole new world of what furniture, functional art should be. What we need to do is just set up our shop right there. And then we have our source of wood for probably a decade. We play with the kids, do a little fly fishing. And then we're surrounded by incredible inspiration. There'd be enough inspiration here to last a lifetime, just in this one location. Charlie Hoffman takes us through the artistic creation of a Hoffman original guitar. first guitar was finished in June of 1970. I played it, I thought it sounded good, but I needed feedback and one of my very good friends who was a good guitar player and a musician immediately asked me to make one for him. It's taken me a long time to be completely comfortable with the notion that I make really nice acoustic guitars. When talking about what makes a guitar sound good, the simple answer is everything. The issue that we're constantly dealing with, with guitar tops specifically, is that they are being subjected to 175, 200 pounds of pressure 24-7 from the strings being on them. And left to its own device, this piece of wood, which is about 110 thousandths of an inch thick, would blow up very soon. So what we have to do is apply braces inside. This is called an X-brace. It's actually two pieces of wood that are notched and glued together. Hide glue is essentially gelatin. It is the oldest form of glue that we know of. There is at least some reason to think that hide glue makes guitars that sound better. The point of heating up the wood is so that the glue will not get cold. The size, the placement, the design of the braces to the top has more to do with the sound of the guitar than anything else, just flat out. And so the process of carving braces makes or breaks a guitar. 
For me, what I'm doing is partly the woodworking thing. It's partly that I love guitars. I think that they are artful, they are beautiful, they are fun to hold, I love the sound of them. But there's another part of it, and this may sound a little grandiose, but I really believe that music is important in this world. I'm not a musician, but I can contribute by making guitars for other people to make music. It's a very delicate quality, but my specialty is a kind of a naked sound. I don't have a lot of effects. I'm just playing with just the acoustic instrument. I mean, every different guitar has got a personality, and the kind of uh, vocabulary you'll play on it uh, will spring from that kind of personality on the guitar. Now, one, the great thing about this guitar is it plays very, very well uh, everywhere. The guitars that I choose to make are ones that follow the tone that's in my head. I like guitars that tend to be very clean, not muddy, crisp, uh, have a lot of projection, power, dynamic range. That's what I like to hear. Of all the things that people ask me about building guitars, how do you bend the wood is the most common. This is Indian rosewood. I soaked it in a tray of water for a couple hours. I'm going to be clamping it to this form here, which is heated. Uh, it is currently about four or 500 degrees. The water and the heat are what make the bending work. The hard part is the starting and getting everything lined up. And then the actual bending around the jig is pretty straightforward and pretty easy. Done. There are people in this world who buy expensive guitars and hang them on the wall and look at them. And to me, that's not just the glass is half empty as, as opposed to half full, it's the glass is empty. They're supposed to make music. So I love the look of them, I love the feel of them, but if the other part of it, the making music, is not there, then somehow that guitar is being cheated. This particular piece, the bending went very well. It's, the curves are smooth with, with no kinks or anything like that. A very large part of the enjoyment of what I'm doing is with any guitar of any model, whether I'm making it for an individual or just on spec for hanging on the wall, is at some point, I string it up for the first time, and I get to hear it, and I enjoy that. And they're all different, maybe not radically different, but they're all different, and it gives me pleasure to hear that. When Tim is playing, my response to it is partly, oh my God, he's playing my guitar. How cool is that? But an awful lot of my guitars are in the hands of people who just play them and enjoy them. date I have made 602 guitars and seeing somebody come in and pick up their new guitar and play it and there's a light in their eyes is very gratifying. Sam and Sarah Evans share the painstaking process of refurbishing pianos. I'm Samuel Evans, and my shop is Modcott Piano Company.
most of the pianos we work on are kind of from the vintage piano category, uh, 1890s to uh, probably about 1930 is the, the majority of our work. But we also get a lot of uh, newer pianos, some almost brand new, that just have a, a factory defect that requires a good amount of repair work. Part of the love is just the, the, the renewal of something that's old. Follow it pretty closely. Restoring a piano for a client that, you know, was their grandmother's piano or great grandmother's piano. And when it's really a piece of the family, a piece of the family's history, we're renewing it for the next generation, or maybe multiple generations to come. I'm Sarah Evans. I get to tear down pianos a lot. Sarah's a super hard worker. She's uh, always ready to jump in and help with whatever needs to be done. When I first met Sam, yes, he was working on piano. I thought it was pretty cool. Basically, my role was to come hang out with him at the shop. But as time has gone on, um, now I'm becoming more interested in actually helping work on pianos, but also the books and make sure pianos get out on time. It's everything moving forward, that's for sure. There we go. The shop really is an industrial space, commercial space. It's just a big box that we've tried to make feel like home. Drake is five and Lila is three. We just want them to be a part of our business, of the space, of the music that happens. Having the kids around, I'm sure it's aiding them there in the way their little minds work. Just add them to the tree. We've hung old relics of piano parts on all the walls. Artwork from friends and the local art scene. I just need something to inspire me and something to drift off and look at it from time to time. One of my first jobs was stripping the old varnish off of pianos. You can't do anything grosser than strip paint and varnish off a hundred-year-old piano. I think I fell in love with the actual working on pianos. It wasn't like a, a love of piano music, it was a fascination with how the piano was constructed. Sam is a perfectionist. It takes time to make these instruments beautiful. I think one of the biggest things, if you're going to work on pianos, you need to have an attention to the details. You can build a piano that works without that, but really to have an instrument that is going to excel and something that the musicians are going to love and that is going to uh, be something that's beautiful to look at for years to come. It's a lot of just paying attention to all the small things. Even I can get annoyed with how long it can take to finish a project, but the fact that he's not willing to compromise the perfection is, is okay. The piano movers are coming in and picking up something that was done two weeks ago and I'm still walking around it with a rag and polishing. Hopefully when they, when they see it in the future, they, they go, wow, this, this was done really well. Yeah, I mean, you can't take anything with you, so it's more about what you can leave behind. And and yes, the this piano business is our is our our life, but it's not like we're stuck in just this one thing. Because he's a dreamer, then we're going to continue to go further.
next time on Colores. Most of all, I look to bring a, a humanity to the characters. Filmmaker Chris Ayer, winner of the Sundance Filmmakers Trophy and Audience Award, winner of Best Film at the American Indian Film Festival, shares his inspiration and creative vision. Major Ridge was always thought of as the villain. Noted sculptor, painter, and printmaker John Wilson is best known for his powerful portraits of African American men. He spent many years portraying Martin Luther King Jr. He was a man who had ideas about the world that he was trying to make other people feel and understand. We're rich. We're rich. Where did you get them? How did they get them? She said, Melvin. Melvin, they're not diamonds. They're a thing called rhinestones. From American Masters, Mel Brooks' Make a Noise, we get a glimpse at the funny man's childhood. Created by the Architects of Air, a luminarium transports visitors into an exciting new world of space and light. The shapes come from uh, inspiration from nature, from plants, soap bubbles. Um, some of the inspiration comes from uh, the bazaars of Iran. Until next time, thank you for watching.